The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Cindy Zhu with the U.S. Department of Energy's Better Buildings Initiative. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the March edition of uh, our Better Buildings webinar series. In this series, we profile the best practices of Better Buildings Challenge and Alliance partners and other organizations working to improve energy efficiency in buildings. Today, we are excited to focus this webinar on energy efficiency and the role that buildings play in human health and wellness. Uh, the buildings in which we live, work, and play have a direct impact on our mental and physical health. This webinar will showcase better buildings partners who are implementing design strategies and benchmarks in their buildings and sustainability plans that focus on the wellness, health, and productivity of the people uh, inside them. Uh, before we get started with our presentations, I want to remind our audience that we will hold discussion questions until near the end of the hour. Uh, we will be uh, discussing some research results as well, so if you have any clarifying questions along the way, uh, please use the chat box and we'll try to, uh, try to answer them. Um, please uh, put your questions through the chat box on your webinar screen throughout the session today, uh, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, the session will be archived and posted uh, to our Better Building Solutions Center um, for your reference. Uh, next slide, please. We have a great trio of speakers today who will lend their expertise on several aspects of buildings and health. Our first speaker, Beth Hawkins, is co-founder and vice president of Three Cubed, a nonprofit research organization that is focusing on state and regional studies that assess and monetize the health and household uh, related impacts of energy efficiency programs in several states in the Northwest and Midwest US. Um, our second speaker, Sarah Neff, is Senior Vice President at Kilroy Realty, a Better Buildings Alliance partner. Uh, since Sarah started at Kilroy, uh, they went from having no sustainability program to being named the number one publicly traded office real estate company on sustainability in North America uh, by the Global Real Estate bench, uh, Sustainability Benchmark. Uh, and under her leadership, the company recently committed to becoming the first carbon neutral real estate company in North America by the end of 2020. Um, our final speaker, Megan O'Neill, is the Energy Program Manager for the City of Atlanta, Mayor's Office of Resilience, uh, focusing on uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and water efficiency policies and projects. The City of Atlanta is a Better Buildings Challenge partner that has a goal of transitioning to 100% clean energy by 2035. Uh, so now let's get started and hear from our first uh, panelist, Beth Hawkins who will share research results about how weatherization programs directly impact um, health and wellness of residents in single family and multifamily housing. Uh, so next slide. And uh, take it away, Beth. Um, hi, greetings everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, thanks for the introduction. And uh, I think you go ahead and advance to the, the next slide. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna kick off the webinar with a story. But I'm speculating that, that many of you are familiar with it. Uh, the characters in the story are real people. They are our disadvantaged population that suffer disproportionately from health disparities. And the people in today's story live in affordable multifamily buildings. So if the building that they call home gets weatherized, will their lives change? Will their health and well-being improve? Do residents of weatherized multifamily buildings experience the same type and magnitude of non-energy impacts than single-family residents? Today, I appreciate the opportunity to share select findings from our studies that will inform the study. Uh, sorry, the story. Next slide. Uh, but first, I want to acknowledge those that funded our project, the JPB Foundation and the Utility Program Administrators in the state of Massachusetts. Um, I have the best team on the planet, in my opinion, as Bruce and Aaron and Michaela here at 3 Cubed, Slipstream, previously known as 7th Wave, the NMR Group, and the University of Tennessee here in Knoxville. The contributors that we have listed here made this work possible, and we are super grateful. Um, next slide. So I know you guys want to get to the juicy stuff, the evidence, but I need to provide some context, so I'll just give you a very brief overview of our current multifamily project. I'll not be discussing any methodology and all those researchy things on this uh, webinar. 
Um, I will present a graphic that helps conceptualize the connection between weatherization and the direct and indirect impacts on occupant health and well-being. Uh, and then I'll, I will show some results that take this story home. Oh, and before we move on, please note that these results are preliminary and have not been fully vetted by our sponsors, so please uh, do not cite any of the figures at this time. Next slide, please. So our goal for this project uh, is to assess and monetize the health-related NEIs of multifamily weatherization. We, and uh, many others really, have conducted NEI research in the single-family space, but not so much in the multifamily space. So our hypothesis is that even though occupants of single-family housing experience the same social determinants of health and well-being as those that reside in multifamily buildings, their structures, one, behave differently from a building science perspective, two, often contain different building systems, and three, typically different weatherization measures are installed. So therefore, NEIs experienced by multifamily residents will likely vary in impact from, single, <clears throat> from NEIs experienced from single family residents. So our sample includes affordable multifamily buildings containing five plus units scattered throughout the Midwest and the Northeast with a large concentration in Massachusetts. Uh, the eligible buildings fit into one of the following three sample groups. One, those that have already been weatherized, the comparison with treatment group, uh, we refer to them as the CWT group. Uh, the second group, uh, those that will soon be weatherized, the treatment group. And the third will not be weatherized, and so they serve as our control, and we refer to them as the C group. Uh, next slide, please. So the key components of this study uh, are as follows. The cornerstone of the project is the resident survey, which addresses health, budget, apartment conditions, and community resilience. And through these results, we will monetize the multifamily NEIs. Um, in phase two, which starts summerish of this year and extends to March 2020, we will administer a follow-up resident survey, <clears throat> excuse me, where we aim to compare the pre and the post for the same households. So we are also surveying property managers to capture building systems resilience benefits or identify opportunities and interview property owners to glean insights on the multifamily weatherization process. I, I will not be presenting anything um, from, from those components today. Uh, data with a soul. This is a qualitative component that captures the human story through interviews with occupants. And uh, we are currently in the process of identifying candidates to, to interview for this component. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So uh, these quotes are from single family residents that are participating in another evaluation that we're conducting um, of an energy efficiency program delivered by TBA in the Southeast. So I'm sharing these personal stories from single family residents, not only because they are impactful, but what these anecdotes tells us or tell us, as I mentioned earlier, the income eligible demographic, whether they reside in multifamily or single family, tend to suffer from the same social determinants of health and well-being, and we can substantiate this hypothesis with our results. Just thought I'd pause just a second so you guys can read some of those. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so this is a graphic that has helped us map out the connection between weatherization and direct and indirect impacts on occupant health well-being and budget issues in general. Um, this graphic is not necessarily my favorite for presentations as it's, it's quite wordy, um, but I'll walk you through and we'll just follow one pathway. So in the top left corner, we see a box with common weatherization measures. And of course, not all households get this, the whole suite of measures and measures are not installed at the same rate in multifamily as single family and vice versa. Um, and, um, sorry, as a result, uh, the, the structure, the building structure, has ideally been improved. So let's focus on improved thermal performance, number two in the bottom left box. 
So improved thermal performance directly improves health as folks experience less medical conditions associated with thermal stress, which as we know in extreme conditions can actually be fatal. So not only did we potentially avoid a death, but the need for medical treatment for thermal stress has decreased. With improved health, less time spent at the doctor or the emergency room, a person might end up not missing as many days of work, which if you don't receive sick pay, you miss work and you lose money. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide characterizes our sample population. So all this is, is good information. So we as researchers can compare the compatibility between groups and look for variables that might influence or confound the results. Uh, but, but what I really wanted to point out to you all on this slide are the ends, the sample sizes that are presented at the top in the dark blue row. Um, not too shabby in my opinion. Um, the next slide, please. So for the remainder of this presentation, I will reveal results from the resident survey, as I mentioned earlier. 1,660 households representing 2,448 persons and 361 buildings. Please note uh, that the preliminary results from phase one are comparisons between the CWT group serving as the weather ice group and the T plus C group representing collectively the unweatherized group. So when we receive phase two data, we can, in theory, compare the results pre-post for the same household. Uh, next slide. Okay, so these are some data points that tell the story from improved dwelling quality attributable to low income weatherization to observed outcomes, the NEIs. So let's go left to right, uh, the top row first. So imagine grandmother Jones living in a building that is very drafty, which is contributing to her apartment being at an unsafe temperature. The thermal performance is inadequate due to say poor insulation and large cracks around the windows. Her heating system is about hundred years old and inefficient and ineffective. She's struggling to pay her energy bill. Meanwhile, using her oven uh, to heat her home and to stay at a safe temperature. And um, now let's add a bit of mold, possibly due to the dampness coming through the cracks. And let's also add a grandchild with, with asthma. So the values represent the degree of change between um, pre and post. So post weatherization, we see a decrease in indicators of inadequate housing that have direct impacts on health. And many of these are at a statistically significant level. Okay, so if you could take a look at the bottom row now. So due to all the improvements, Grandmother Jones and or her neighbors potentially experience a decrease in number of emergency department and non-urgent care visits due to exposure to extreme cold. Um, skip that middle one just for a second. So the grandchild with asthma and any asthmatic neighbors may experience a mean decrease in number of emergency department and hospitalizations from a decrease in asthma flare-ups. Uh, scooting back to the not eating data point. We asked the following question, in the past four weeks, did you or any household member go a whole day and night without eating anything because there was not enough food? So I said earlier, many of us are familiar with this story. These NEIs that I just discussed here are, are the usual suspects and the connection with weatherization really passes the lab test, as, as my team says. Um, next slide. But then we have these potential NEIs that are not as familiar to us. These are the ones that do not immediately you know, cause us to think, all right, of course, sure. So when we were designing our survey instrument, we wanted to explore additional health conditions and associated symptoms that have the potential to be impacted by improving dwelling quality through weatherization. So these four are pretty interesting, I think, um, and deserve further research. So we're not making the case that weatherization cures these conditions, but that it can decrease the frequency and perhaps the severity of symptoms we can see with this data right here that post weatherization, um, there, there's a drop. 
Um, next slide, please. Okay, so now let's look at outcomes that we believe have the potential to improve grandmother Jones's sense of well-being and her quality of life, as well as her grandchild and neighbors. I mean, it makes sense that these outcomes could improve well-being. I mean, less rodent infestation, feeling safer on the property, perhaps in part because there was improved lighting. Um, the apartment does not very often have unpleasant odors seeping into their space from the outside and perhaps even sleep better without as many noise disturbances because the outdoor noise pollution has decreased. Next slide. So on the previous slide, we saw evidence that outdoor noise pollution can be reduced through weatherization. Furthermore, number of poor sleep days has decreased or to remove the confusing double negative, an increase in number of days of quality sleep. The number of days mental health was not good has decreased, as well as the number of days our respondents' activities were limited due to poor health, just in general. So the chart on the right presents questions that have the potential to influence community resilience outcomes, specifically social cohesion. Social cohesion is a predicting factor for, for community preparedness through a willingness to help neighbors during times of crisis. So if weatherization can increase the resilience of residents of multifamily buildings in the face of extreme events, or even just the constant daily stresses that are pressing down on them, then we really need to think about weatherization as way more than an energy program, but a health and wellness program. Next slide. So in conclusion, uh, initial analysis does suggest that there are multifamily NEIs attributable to weatherization. We have seen through our other single family NEI studies that occupants of single family housing experience the same social determinants of health and well being as those that reside in multifamily buildings, but the NEIs have been shown to vary in impact from single family NEIs and should not be generalized to multifamily buildings. So, lastly, as we saw on the previous slide, the multifamily system provides opportunities to contribute to social cohesion and community resilience. And the end. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Beth. Um, that, that was a really great visualization of, of some of the uh, things that, you know, a lot of us already know about buildings and health, um, but it's just very striking to uh, to see that uh, that those comparisons um, on the screen. Um, so a quick uh, question that we have for you. Um, someone asked when the, the final study will be published um, and where uh, it can be found. Um, it will it, it will not be published until 2020, which seems like a long way away, but really it's not. And um, we will at minimum have it posted on our website. And um, we will be discussing where we will disseminate the, the report. And um, so, so there's that answer. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so now we will hear from our next presenter, Sarah Neff. Uh, so Sarah, tell us how a landlord like Kilroy Realty is working on issues uh, of health and wellness in commercial offices. Absolutely. Thank you um, so much uh, to um, Cindy and the whole rest of the Better Buildings Challenge team for having me. Um, so Cindy said, I'm going to go through how, what sort of health looks like in commercial real estate and how we're implementing um, uh, health, uh, you know, projects and features and programs um, in our portfolio. Um, I just want to give a little um, sense of my company for those who aren't familiar with us. Um, Kilroy Realty is a West Coast real estate investment trust publicly traded, um, and we own about 14 million square feet of mostly office space, a little bit of life science, um, one residential tower, which I'll just talk about later, and uh, some retail to support mixed use projects. Um, and we are primarily active on the West Coast, and we're a long-term hold, um, is a tends to be our business model, and that will also um, come into play later. Okay, next slide. Skip over this, you guys know what I'm gonna say. <laughs> All 
All right, so I just want to um, start this off with a um, with a story um, to just sort of show why health in the built environment is important to me. Um, so when she was about two, uh, my daughter Nora, pictured here, um, started coughing herself to sleep every single night. And um, it wasn't going away. She'd always been the sick of our two kids, you know, the one with the endless colds and the ear infections and trips to the doctor and stuff. Um, so we just thought the cough was just one more thing. Um, but it wasn't going away. So we took her to the doctor and uh, she started putting her on the breathing treatment that you see here. Um, and then that wasn't working and steroids got added. Um, those weren't working. It was just agonizing. Um, and then only six months later when she got um, officially diagnosed with asthma was um, was it the first time that I uh, thought, oh my goodness, I wonder if it's something about the air in our house. We live pretty close to a busy freeway. Um, and we got an air filter and the problem was gone in two days and she hasn't coughed herself to sleep um, since then. And I illustrate that story because um, I do this for a living. <laughs> you know, I'm a green building professional. I and mean, then the connection between health and air quality um, and the built environment wasn't clear to me. And so this is a really tough concept for people to grasp. Now I do this every day and yet my own home's impacts were not something that I was immediately grasping. Um, and so that is one of the things that really spurred me to um, really ensure that um, my buildings at work um, are really, really promoting health. So what does that look like? Uh, next slide. Um, so what that looks like is it's based on a lot of research. So we heard a fantastic, um, an absolutely fantastic presentation from Beth. I bet that's just, the, those are amazing results and I love those and I can't wait to highlight them. Um, we also read a whole lot of research um, at Kilroy. Um, one, is, a major study is the COG effect study, um, otherwise known as the impact of green buildings on cognitive function out of Harvard. Um, Stoke um, did a great white paper on the financial case for high performance buildings. Um, and so we really look at this research, not just my anecdotal experience with um, in my own family, um, but the research um, around the world basically showing there's deep connections between health and productivity, and we want to provide that for our tenants. And I can actually um, make a little um, fun announcement uh, today as of this morning. Um, Tori is going to be participating in um, the newest um, cognitive effects study out of Harvard, which is um, putting a bunch of air sensors around offices and giving people Fitbits and connecting how active and productive they are with the actual air quality at that time. So I'm really excited to be participating. So this is um, a lot of the research we used when we were um, creating the foundation for our health program. It really motivated us to create such a program. Next. Um, and so here's what a basic, um, here's what our, our health program is. Um, the the Cognitive Effects study and others have shown that when carbon dioxide goes up, um, I, uh, IQ goes down. And when carbon dioxide is down, IQ goes up. And so air quality is um, one of the two major tenants of our program. And I'll get into how we ensure good air quality later. Next. And the other part of our program is active design. So what health looks like in commercial real estate is a combination right now of two things. It's good air quality and active design. I can talk about what active design is, but it's sort of intuitive. It's design features that make you more active in the space. So this is an example from this illustration from the Bullet Center, which has a really fun staircase. I've taken it myself. It is, um, they call it the irresistible stair. It makes you, it makes you want to get up and, and move around. Um, one of the, uh, uh, studies that have come out show that if, you know, taking two flights of stairs helps adults avoid most, um, you know, normal adult weight gain. And so, you know, thinking of active design as, you know, a pedestrian, um, you know, activated place where people can walk to work or can bike to work and um, are able to have sit-stand desks because they're more active during the day and can avoid back problems. So all of these things, we consider that active design. So good air quality, active design. Next. So this is what um, our health programs look like at Kilroy. Um, our health programs are sort of split into three highly overlapping areas. Um, our employees, our tenants, and our buildings. I'm not gonna get too much into the employee wellness other than the Fitbit study I was talking about earlier. Most of that is run by human resources and that's you know health insurance and other benefits, they'll pay for Weight Watchers, that kind of thing. So I'm gonna talk mostly about buildings but a little bit about how we engage our tenants on health. Next. So as I said, I'm active design. 
So here is, and I'll go through how we do active design and air quality um, in our building. So here's what active design looks like um, in a building. This is a development project we are working on in San Diego. Um, it has a lot of millennial looking people um, hanging around in it. Um, but I wanna point out some features. These are very typical of Kilroy buildings. So first of all, we have, um, there's a lot of bike access. Um, so these um, doors that make it easy to take your bike in, there's bike storage inside and outside. And we see an activated outdoor space. So there's people working outside, they get a connection with, out, with the outdoors. There's a lot of research that shows that a connection with the outdoors helps with productivity. Um, we make it really attractive to um, work inside and outside. And then you can see that there's um, a lot of glazing into the office space that means that people have access to daylight and views. Next. Um, another thing that we love at Kilroy is our stairwells. Um, and so these are two pictures um, from one of our buildings that went through Fitwell certification, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and one of the things that Fitwell really rewards is um, activating your stairwells. Um, and so we both put um, in the elevator lobbies, we have these, what I think are very cute graphics um, that uh, encourage people to take the stairs instead of the elevator. And also, in, when you're in the stairwell, there's, um, the stairwells are full of sort of uh, these sort of motivational um, little phrases that people can look at. And also, there's sort of little figures that are moving around and so it makes people really want to take the stairs. Again, there's a lot of research showing that when you have activated stairwells with wayfinding, um, that people do take them. And I will say one of the um, unexpected benefits, this is a tall office tower with a lot of elevator traffic. Um, and with more people taking the stairs, we've actually noticed that the elevator wait times are less. So that was an unexpected benefit that we were, um, that we were able to experience. Next. And I just wanna talk about what bike storage looks like in, um, uh, in commercial real estate. It no longer looks like, oh, hey, I'm gonna throw some bike racks in the parking garage. No, now we talk about bike spas. <laughs> Um, and so this is an example from a project in Seattle um, that has a, it's right on a major bike transit route, um, which we actually helped improve as part of the site improvements. And um, we expect a lot of people to be biking to this site. And so we have this really beautiful bike facility. It has signage, it's right on the ground floor. Um, great, a lot of storage. There's also repair facilities in there. So again, we're really seeing a whole lot of active design. Next and the air quality monitoring. So this looks pretty boring, I have to admit. Um, this is what air quality monitoring looks like to me. Um, air quality monitoring um, looks like uh, taking a lot of samples of um, the air in various buildings. Um, and that's where, that's where we're at. We're at um, annual sampling. The current sort of state of the market in commercial real estate is that um, sensor technology that uh, will continuously monitor the air it makes all the sense in the world. There's a lot of people working on it. Um, there's not a ton of adoption in commercial real estate. We'll actually be deploying our first continuous air, air sensors as a result of this Harvard study. Um, but right now, um, what commercial real estate is looking at is looking at annual testing. Um, these are, uh, and I swear I chose this at random, these are very good readings. Um, so according to the cognitive effects study, you're looking for CO2 levels at or below 550 parts per million. Um, the typical sort of quote good office will um, like California building codes, for example, will get you to nine, 945 parts per million. Um, but, you know, I will also say that like in my house, um, if we don't open the windows and after we all are cooking dinner with all the gas stove and everybody breathing, it can go above 3000. And then we, I freak out because air quality is something I really care about. And I'm always opening the windows and everybody's cold. Um, so air quality can range a whole lot and very quickly. Um, and so it is something that we really want to keep a, keep a close eye on. So annual air quality testing. Next. And then the other piece of this is healthy materials. So we have uh, a building standards document that requires um, both in the base buildings and then also requires of our tenants um, that they maintain standards for um, healthy materials. I didn't want to just have a picture of a materials um, data sheet because those um, are just full of a bunch of numbers. So um, we also in really encourage products that have achieved a health product declaration um, where they really know um, what all of their health impacts are. But at the very minimum, we're looking for low or no VOC, you know, paints, adhesives, and coatings. We're looking for no urea, urea formaldehyde and any, you know, um, composite wood products, we're looking for certified carpets and um, hardwood floors. So that is also how we are maintaining um, 
a, a good air quality uh, level within our spaces. And then I want to talk a little bit about um, our tenants. So one of the things we do is we really try to engage our tenants on health. Um, this is an example, that is a picture I snapped um, at, in my own building at a wellness fair we had um, last January. So you can see we've invited um, people who are related to health, um, from, uh, from healthy food to ergonomics to, um, you know, other, you know, other chiropractic stuff, um, exercise, gym memberships um, are there so that tenants can engage. We're giving out free massages. Um, the lady in the with the blonde hair in sort of the background definitely convinced me to sign up for a, a farm share for um, for fresh produce, which I still get. Um, and so this is also something we're doing. So we wanted we have active events with tenants in addition to sort of them passively receiving the health benefits we have in our buildings. And the other thing is we know that. Um, people like to feel connected to their communities. I didn't want to show a picture of it because it's a little bit, uh, you know, can, people can be squeamish, but we also, you know, host blood drives in our buildings. And I think people really get a sense of community out of participating in those and other community events um, like that. Um, and so that, those are ways we um, are connecting with our tenants. Also, you know, buildings will do things ad hoc. We'll open up a vacant suite if a tenant wants to use it for a yoga class. We'll create, um, we had a tenant ask to us to create a, like a little walking path around their campus. And so we put little mile markers in so people can know how long they walk. People really like that. That was a really low cost, easy thing. Um, so those are ways that we, we engage our tenants on health and adult environment. Next. Um, and then we believe in certifications. Um, I'm a believer in certifications because I think, A, it holds you to a third party standard, um, and it also provides that third party validation um, that we're looking for. So um, we are big believers um, for our existing portfolio in FitWell certification um, with 15 certifications that actually gives us the most certifications of any non-government um, real estate uh, owner in, um, I think, in the world. Um, uh, that that FitWell just announced, um, and our goal is to get 40% of our portfolio FitWell certified um, by the end of this year. Um, FitWell is very much based on um, a whole lot of research uh, around health and productivity based on um, research out of the Centers for Disease Control and others. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about um, the FitWell process and when we have question time. And then the other thing we've done is we have um, a well-certified building. So I mentioned earlier that we have a residential tower. Um, we went ahead and certified that. Um, we were one of the pilots for well for multifamily residential. Um, and that was a lot more based on our, uh, it was before people had moved in. And so it was based on construction practices and a whole lot of air quality testing, water quality testing, all that, all that good stuff. So we, um, we also like to sort of receive third-party validation for our health program. And I want to talk a little bit about results. Um, this is an article that the LA Times wrote about us for, um, for, for that uh, health certification we've gotten for that uh, residential tower. And one of the things that I want to point out, I realize this is very busy because it's a screenshot, um, but uh, they, the LA Times, without telling me, um, interviewed one of my tenants. Um, about how he felt about being in the building. And what he says is that um, he's noticed that when he's in his um, apartment, his allergies are nowhere near what they used to be. And um, he's actually experiencing positive health outcomes himself. Um, and when people, I get asked about the ROI of health and um, I shy away from that for a variety of reasons. I mean, for example, with FitWell certification, it's quite difficult to get it for um, very suburban assets because um, there's a lot of research showing that single car driving long commutes are not particularly good for you. Um, and that's fine, but the, our more urban assets also often command higher rents. And so it would be very misleading if I compared my FitWell and non-FitWell buildings. Um, and so I don't have the, I don't like to make financial case um, arguments. What I will say is there's been a major reputational benefit through coverage in um, major publications like the Los Angeles Times. We do have investors asking about it, um, and we are figuring out, we, the investors just want to know about, like, quote, health, but without really knowing what metrics to ask for, and that's okay. You know, we're still, you know, early days in health. It took, you know, the real estate industry a while to just figure out that health was really active design and air quality um, of the things to you know, care about. 
Um, and so there will be metrics eventually, but I do get investor questions about it. They're very interested in it. Um, and But often what I say is to like, okay, what's the ROI? I like to say like, what's the ROI of the holiday decorations in the lobby around Christmas? And the answer is like, there isn't one and that's a ridiculous question. Um, and I feel the same way about this. Like to, to us at Coray, like health is the right thing to do. We want our buildings to promote health because we want happy tenants that, you know, renew their leases or want to lease space in our buildings. And we just think it's what a responsible, you know, for thinking landlord does. Um, and so honestly, like we sort of, I think that's a little bit of a, we think it's a little bit of a silly question. Um, and, you know, we've, we're, we've been really able to find the value through a lot of very low cost upgrades that we think have really helped improve um, our buildings a lot and really improve the value of the building. Next. And that's it for me. So I will turn it over to Megan. Um, great. Thank you, Sarah. And I already see a lot of good questions uh, coming in. So we'll, we'll get to that towards the end of the hour. Um, and and uh, I'll just remind everyone uh, to use the chat box on the screen. Uh, we'll continue collecting uh, Q&A uh, uh, for the remainder of the session. Um, so finally, let's hear from Megan O'Neill uh, on what the city of Atlanta is doing to improve wellness at a city scale. Thank you, Cindy. So let's go ahead and go to the slide with the map on it. Don't mind. So Atlanta is one of the 100 resilient cities in the Rockefeller Resilient Cities Network. And when we talk about resilience as a city, we're talking about all of the different inputs that go into what makes a city. So that includes health, obviously, safety, economic development, prosperity, and in our office, the Mayor's Office of Resilience, we place a really strong focus on clean energy and how the public health impacts within the city are tied to that. Next slide, please. We define urban resilience as the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, businesses and systems within a city to survive, adapt, and grow, no matter what kinds of chronic stresses and acute shocks they experience. In Atlanta, we have neighborhoods where childhood asthma is at almost epidemic levels, and that is a chronic stress that is something that could really be addressed through really thinking about this health and buildings and healthy buildings. <laughs> we have four visions for a resilient Atlanta, and within our offices, energy planning, building performance planning, that ties into visions two, three, and four. Next slide, please. And really the homework program that we are looking at as we approach this and have really has really helped crystallize our work on this issue is the Atlanta Better Buildings Challenge Program. This is a program that was launched in 2011 as we were one of the first three cities to participate in this DOE initiative. And in the Atlanta program, we focused on a 20% reduction in energy and water use by 2020 using a 2009 baseline. We have over 116 million square feet of commercial building space committed to the program, which accounts for about 600 properties. Our participants are really varied. We have commercial real estate folks from your typical class A office space, but we also have pretty much every major university in the city. We've established in the last two years a really successful partnership with the Center for Disease Control, which is based right here in Atlanta. And part of that partnership includes regular health education events, looking at the FitWell program, looking at health and wellness in buildings, things like lactation rooms, we did an education session on, and really just thinking about your tenants in your buildings. Next slide, please. Beyond looking at the tenant space in buildings, we're also looking at the impact of the building efficiency outside of the building. So this slide is a map basically demonstrating the public health benefits of the Atlanta Better Buildings Challenge Program. Every county that is a color other than gray is a county that has benefited from the reductions in energy use in our buildings. 
this is the result. If you use less energy in a building, then your utility doesn't need to, say, burn as many fossil fuels to power your building. And that has a spillover effect that goes well outside of our jurisdiction. In fact, the darkest red dot that you see on that map is Birmingham, Alabama, which is in an entirely different state. They are actually the primary beneficiary of the public health benefits of the Atlanta Better Buildings Challenge. And I think they might owe us a thank you for that one day. Next slide, please. We're also looking at well-being in our own assets. The city of Atlanta has a really broad building portfolio from City Hall, which you'll see on the right, to our water treatment plants, to the world's largest airport, Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport. We are doing a lot of interesting things in these buildings. We're undergoing a major energy savings performance contract that through doing these large scale improvements has really forced us to look at our buildings holistically rather than through piecemeal efficiency improvements like one lighting project one month followed by some other retrofit a few months later. By doing whole building projects, we're able to make sure that we're doing them in a healthy way so that we're not just sealing up windows without thinking about the impact on our indoor air quality. And instead, when we're sealing those windows, we are also making sure that we make the appropriate ventilation adjustments to make our buildings stay healthy. We have also just instituted some programming. We have a wellness center directly across the street from City Hall that employees can take advantage of. We, a few years ago, passed what we call our sustainable design standards for our own properties, which set in place a requirement that all our buildings come lead silver certified for new construction and major renovation, as well as lead existing building certification for all existing properties over 25,000 square feet. These are requirements we're phasing in now. We're actually having to go back to city council in the next few months to revisit that policy because we got pushback from departments about how there might be alternative policy, alternative certifications that are more aggressive, such as Well or Earthcraft or others that they didn't want to have prohibited to help satisfy this requirement because some departments want to go above and beyond that initial lead requirement to really look at building better buildings. Next slide, please. And I guess that's it for me. Thank you. All right, thank you, Megan. Um, so I'd like to point out some specific resources uh, that were provided by each of our presenters today, uh, which you can access um, when we get the uh, presentation uh, uh, uploaded online. Um, we have uh, resources from 3Cubed about their uh, research publications on health benefits for single family. Um, as Beth mentioned earlier, uh, the multifamily results won't be completed until um, uh, next year, but you can take a look at uh, some of the methodology and findings they have for, for single family. Um, she also uh, uh, sent uh, several other resources around uh, how to make uh, multifamily housing more energy efficient. Um, Sarah sent over a really cool uh, link to a TED talk that she gave uh, recently on buildings and health. Um, so uh, I, I believe it's around 15 minutes. So I think that's a, a great way to um, uh, learn a little bit more about how Kilroy is tackling this issue. Um, and then you can also uh, learn more about what the city of Atlanta is doing um, around energy efficiency, resilience, and health as a whole. Um, all right, next slide. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, take some questions from the audience. Uh, you can continue um, putting those into the chat box. Um, I will start with Beth. Um, so someone asked um, is, if there's any sense on how long uh, the impacts uh, around health and wellness in pre and post uh, weatherized uh, buildings will last. Oh, well, sorry, I was on mute. Um, yes, when we monetize the NEIs, we um, we estimate the annual impact by a household, and we base the length of that impact um, that can be experienced by a resident off the lifetime of the measure, which for this project we're estimating to be 20 years. Okay, great. Um, we have a couple questions for Sarah. Um, so first, uh, there are studies that point to the financial return of health and wellness um, that uh, tend to focus on value to the tenants and to the employer. 
Um, do, are, do you know of any studies that show financial value to owners for investing in health and wellness across owned assets? Um, uh, basically, um, studies that you know show the direct benefit to the owner that would uh, uh, implement these measures. Yeah, it's really tough um, for for that um, because so much of it is very people focused. So there's a couple of ways to sort of skin that cat. I, I think the the Stoke study I had up earlier, the financial case for high performance buildings, um, has some of that in there. Um, but beyond that, I know Fitwell is working on some of this, um, but I don't know of a direct study that links owner benefit. And this is hard. I mean, people, I think this is one of the issues with real estate in general is that people don't realize that a different person owns the building from who works in the building, which is, you know, this concept is a, a difficult one for people to grasp. So um, for us, you know, at least in my portfolio, a lot of the health stuff was just really not that difficult or expensive. Um, and we think of it, I, I liked the way we sort of got, got ourselves sort of sorted out on it was a risk management um, perspective. So we'd had tenants, for example, who said, oh, you know, I'm having a bunch of migraines and my doctor told me maybe it's something about your building. We we're able to send them like a 300 page air quality study saying like, I don't think it's our building. And then, you know, often the complaint goes away. I mean, that's intensely valuable for something that doesn't cost all that much. So I think engaging that team early on is a, is a good way to figure out what the ROI is in terms of, you know, preventative help. But it's, it's not an easy question. Next. Okay, thanks. Um, so this is another question for Sarah, but I think um, Beth might have some insights here too. Uh, this, mm -hmm. So the question is, um, are there lower cost air filters recommended by the presenter? Um, our city is at the intersection of major highways, has extensive air quality issues and a very high asthma rate. Although we're working on energy efficiency policies for rentals, we also need interim practical and actionable recommendations for renters. Um, so are there any uh, specific types of uh, low cost air filters that could um, help this uh, 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 building operator? Yeah, that's um, the one that, you know, the, the one that they're often quite expensive. I mean, the one that my kids school uses, and it's a public school, so they must have gotten funding for it somehow. Um, it's, it's walkable, so it's near the same freeway that I'm next to. I know those are about 500 bucks a pop, which I can't imagine falls into the um, realm of affordable. Um, any, any HEPA air filter is really what you're looking for. Um, we don't have much of a residential portfolio, and so we have those, uh, we have the pricier air filters um, on the floors of my residential tower. I think there's also, I mean, they can clean something like 750 square feet, so instead of maybe needing one in every unit, maybe there's an ability to share. Um, but uh, I think it's I think it'd be a good idea to start researching just like what low cost HEPA air filters there are on the market. They might not be as effective, but they could work. And then there's the, and then the cheaper options are if there's a shared ventilation system, instead of plugging the filter in the unit, um, plug you know adding to the um, adding a filter directly to the, the ventilation system so that benefits everybody. There is going to be a trade-off with energy efficiency. This is a rough thing in the world of health and, you know, and energy. There's a lot of synergies, but there's not always synergies. And so if you have a stronger filter, your the energy bill is going to go up. Um, the health outcomes will improve, and that's certainly cheaper. So hopefully there's a shared system that people can take advantage of. Great, thanks. Um, Beth, do you have anything to add about, you know, sort of low cost um, uh, air filtration methods? No, no, I don't. I, I think that was a good answer um, from Sarah, so. Great, um, okay, so let's uh, get to this. Uh, we have a question about um, that, uh, if ventilation was added as part of the weatherization strategies um, for the three cube studies. Yeah, um, for, we found that for the uh, buildings that are participating in this study, 30% um, did not have any mechanical ventilation um, at all, pre-weatherization. Um, and a third of those that did have ventilation only had bathroom fans. Uh, I just thought I'd share that, that pre-weatherization data point with you first. But through weatherization, we are seeing that mechanical ventilation is being installed. Um, and for this particular sample, 38% of the time. 
which is actually a little bit more than single family. Single family, um, it, about 26% of the time, is ventilation is installed. Okay, uh, this next question is for Megan. Um, uh, uh, it says, uh, working with universities in Atlanta, is utility, utility data tracking a challenge? Um, I know that many colleges and universities struggle with benchmarking because they lack building level energy meters. Yes, we are definitely not unique as a city with those level of difficulties. I'd say any, well, colleges and universities, as well as any owner of a large campus like property, including the city as an asset manager, run into this issue. And you have to work directly with the colleges and universities, facilities, staff to identify the best way possible to benchmark, be that as a campus, be it going to the lowest common denominator of how we'll have situations where we'll have four buildings that each have their own electric meter, but they're all on the same water meter. And how do you treat that situation? And we are so fortunate to have South Face as the program administrator for our challenge program. They are fantastic experts in this space and really dig in and work directly with the asset managers to benchmark to the best degree possible to yield, realize the best possible benefit. Great. Um, and then how did Atlanta determine the distribution of health benefits associated with better buildings uh, participation? So on the map that you saw earlier, each county that was highlighted was essentially if your county realized $10 or more worth of public health benefits than it was highlighted and it got darker as that dollar value increased. That was calculated by a consultancy called the GreenLink Group that did an analysis looking at the grid level impact of efficiency programs in Atlanta and their distribution across the country. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a question uh, back to Sarah. Um, have you been able to make a meaningful connection between energy efficiency and um, health or wellness or productivity? Uh, yeah, I can answer that question. Um, it has tended to be in my portfolio that the, our most energy efficient buildings are the ones that do um, the best on when we do the air quality testing. But a lot of that is because they are the newest buildings. Um, so we're developers as well as owners. And we, you know, when we develop, we've developed very high air standards. Um, and so, and to very, very high energy efficiency um, standards. So they, they do great. I think age is just a major factor when you're trying to deal with um, energy efficiency and health. I mean, the, you know, depending on the vintage of building it is, there was a while where everything was just sealing up the building super duper tight. And, you know, that was great for energy efficiency, but it was a major problem um, from, a, you know, a health and wellness sick building syndrome kind of thing. These days, you know, with economizer technology improving and whatnot, the, the trade-offs are not quite so bad. It's never perfect. Um, but, you know, we, you know, to make, so I would say on a relative basis, my most energy efficient buildings, I think are my healthiest buildings. But also I think that's, that's a little bit of a red herring because I think that's a function of age for the most part. Okay. Um, and then someone asked about uh, green, living green walls, so sort of, you know, walls that have plants integrated um, into them and whether um, they have, uh, if, if they contribute at all to indoor air quality. Um, so I think, Sarah, that might be a, a question for you. Yeah, uh, any, I, can, if, I can answer that. Yeah. <laughs> it was, um, so there's, um, uh, <laughs> so, so the answer is yes, and we have, we have a moss wall, so I think like moths are in some gray area, whether they're even alive. Um, but they, um, so there are plants that filter the air. Um, so at my um, my desk, for example, I'm looking at it right now. I have a lady palm, um, and there's um, if you listen to the TEDx talk, I mentioned a couple others. One is called uh, Janet Craig, which I think is like I don't know Jenny Craig's botanical sister or something. And so I think the the important thing is to choose plant types based on um, based on what they filter out and what you're concerned about. 
Um, weirdly, the National Association of Realtors of all organizations has done, has published a little booklet on this. Um, so to, to pair plants with what they help take out of the air. I'm a big believer in plants in terms of improving air quality, um, but I think it's important to just choose wisely when you're picking your plant types. People often pick plant types for aesthetic reasons, and that's obviously very important, but actually like what they're going to do is something to think about as well. Great. Um, and then uh, a question for Beth um, uh, is whether uh, three cubes will be uh, looking at studying non-energy impacts of weatherizing market rate uh, multifamily properties. Um, yeah, well, we're not at this time and, and haven't yet, uh, not for lack of interest, but up to this point, um, we just haven't had any funding to, to look into that sector. Uh, hopefully uh, sometime in the future that'll change. <laughs> all right, so um, I think uh, that's all we have time uh, for today. If you have additional questions um, directly to our speakers, uh, we will post their contact information. Um, let's uh, move on to the next slide. Um, we hope that you'll all plan to attend the next uh, Better Buildings webinar on Tuesday, April 2nd from 3 to 4 p.m. titled uh, Rethinking Traditional Finance, how energy as a service unlocks new potential for businesses. Um, on this webinar, we will highlight a new efficiency as a service toolkit and better building financial um, allies will share insights from the field. Uh, next slide. Oh, sorry, can you go back one more? Uh, to the, um, yeah, the series, there we go. Um, so additionally, we hope you will uh, join us for the remainder of the Better Buildings webinar series, uh, where we will be taking on um, the most pressing topics facing energy professionals, uh, with new experts leading the conversations on uh, proven best practices, cost-effective strategies, um, and innovative new ways to approach sustainability and energy performance. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, slide. Um, registration is now open for the Better Buildings, Better Plants Summit, will be, which will be held July 10th and 11th in Arlington, uh, Virginia, which is in the DC metro area. Uh, Pre-conference activities such as uh, building tours will take place on Tuesday, July 9th. Uh, to, to find out more about information and browse the agenda, visit the Better Building Solutions Center linked in this slide. Uh, we hope to see you there. Uh, and next slide. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank our panelists very much for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, feel free to contact our presenters directly with our additional questions, um, or if we weren't able to get to your question during the Q&A period. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the Better Buildings Challenge or Alliance, uh, feel free to check out our website or contact myself or my colleague Kendall Sanderson uh, directly at the email shown. I encourage you to follow the Better Buildings Initiative on tw Twitter for all the latest. Uh, and you will receive an email notice when the archive of this session is available online. Thank you, everyone.